you. Sometimes it can feel like an awful lot longer. And yet ministers have still not agreed what new trading relationship they want with Europe after Brexit. The cabinet is deeply split. The foreign secretary has even called one idea the prime minister has been pushing crazy. And now ministers have been told to go away and come back when they found the answer. As for the Labour Party, 80 of their peers, including a former party leader, voted to stay in the single market, which just happens to be against party policy. Now, just in case you think that all this squabbling is about dull detail that you can safely ignore, remember this. It's about the two most basic responsibilities of any government, securing peace and delivering prosperity. <laughs> My guests this week are the leader of the Leave campaign, the Environment Secretary, Michael Gove, the Shadow Brexit Secretary, Labour's Keir Starmer, and Ireland's Deputy Prime Minister, the Tornister, Simon Coveney. I'm filling in for Andrew, who is back home after his operation, and I'm pleased to say is doing well. And what's more, he's here on tape at least, speaking to Hugh Grant about his new role as a man tipped to reach Downing Street, whose reputation was destroyed by a plot to murder his gay lover. This is where you come in, Mr. Oh, God, I'm doing what exactly? You take that thing and you confront him in Dublin. I can't put anything in writing, so I need you to see him in person and warn him off. Reviewing the papers, Chloe Wesley from the Taxpayers' Alliance, the writer and Labour campaigner Ellie May O'Hagan, and the critic Camilla Long. So that's Brexit, peace, prosperity and the Jeremy Thought scandal coming up. But our thoughts today will begin and end with the very sad news of the death of someone who represented all that was best in politics and best in public service, Tessa Jowell. With that and the rest of the day's news, here's Christian Fraser. Good morning. Tributes have been pouring in to the Labour peer and former Cabinet Minister Dame Tessa Jowell, who has died aged 70. The Prime Minister said her final months were a tribute to a lifetime of public service. Dame Tessa, a former Culture Secretary and MP for Dulwich, was diagnosed with a brain tumour in May last year. Her family announced that she died peacefully yesterday at her home in Warwickshire. Earlier this year, she made an emotional speech in the House of Lords when she discussed her condition and called for better access to experimental treatment. And Nick will be talking to Tessa Giles' friend and colleague, Alistair Campbell, after this bulletin. French police have begun a terror investigation after a man armed with a knife killed a man and injured four other people in Paris last night. So-called Islamic State has claimed responsibility for the attack, which happened on a busy street in the Opera district of the city. Media reports say the attacker was born in Chechnya. He was shot dead by police. Theresa May has insisted she can be trusted to deliver the Brexit people voted for amid continuing cabinet divisions over new customs arrangements with the EU. Writing in the Sunday Times, the Prime Minister said the government was continuing to work on the options for a new trading relationship. She said the UK would stay aligned to the EU in some areas and there would have to be compromises. But she would ensure the UK takes back control of its borders, money and laws. Dozens of EU nationals are suing the government for damages after being detained and deported for sleeping rough. Figures contained by the BBC reveal almost 700 people were removed under the policy in a year, even if they were in work or had a right of residence in the UK. The policy has since been ruled unlawful. And finally, it was a night filled with drama at the Eurovision final in Lisbon. The UK's entry by the singer Suri was interrupted when a man ran onto the stage and grabbed the microphone. He was later removed and arrested. Suri declined the offer of a rerun and finished her performance, but she came 24th out of 26. In the end, the night belonged to the 25-year-old Israeli singer Netta, who won the contest with her highly original song, Toy, inspired by the Me Too movement. That's all from me. The next news on BBC One is at one o'clock. Back to you, Nick. Thank you, Christian.
brave and inspirational are words often used of those whose lives are cut short by cancer. They are words which describe Tessa Jowell, the former Minister for the Olympics, whose death has just been announced. They are, though, not nearly enough to describe someone who I regarded it as a privilege to know, someone I could point to when people lazily assert that all politicians are the same and are out for themselves. I, I, along with, I suspect, thousands of others, including many of you now watching, came to see Tessa as a friend. And she did have friends, real friends, on all sides of politics and none. Tessa was a public servant throughout her life, and never more so than when she discovered she had a brain tumour and vowed to fight one more campaign to transform cancer treatment for everybody. In January, I spoke to her at home. There'll be people listening to you who think, why don't you curl up on the sofa, be with your family and friends, look after yourself? Absolutely impossible. And you know, I have so much love. It is the most extraordinary, blessed, and, and recreating sense. Now, I've been lucky enough to read the speech you'll give to the House of Lords. And you end with some words from Seamus Heaney, the poet. And you, you mean it. I am not afraid. I, I am not afraid. I feel very clear about my sense of purpose and what I want to do. And how do I know how long it's going to last? I'm certainly going to do everything I can to make it a very long time. Dame Tessa Jowell, who's death was announced this morning. I'm joined by Alice Gamble, former director of communications at Number 10 and a friend of, the, of Tessa and her family. She really did, didn't she, try in those last few months and weeks, Alistair? And I felt, even when I was in her home there, she was trying to make me, I suspect she tried to make you feel better about it. Well, my daughter said last night, my daughter absolutely loved Tessa to bits and she was weeping last night and she said that Tessa was the only person she's ever known who whoever she was with, wherever she was, that other person was glad to be there. And that she was totally motivated by other people. And even in the way she faced up to her illness, she, from the moment she was diagnosed, she was starting to think about other people who had the same condition. And that's why she did the debate in the Lords and the debate in the Commons, and she got the government to put more money into cancer care. She was completely dedicated to other people. And as you said in the introduction, politicians get such a, a bad rap for, from so many people, but Tessa was not just the best in politics, she was the best of humanity. She was, she was one of the kindest, most compassionate, empathetic people I've ever known. Now, there'll be some people watching who say, well, you would say that, you know, you're a Blair supporter, she was a Blair supporter. But I think what you will have observed is that appeal went right across. Politics. Oh, for sure. And, you know, I can't think of many parliamentarians who would have had the response that she had while still alive, those tributes that were made in the Lords and then in the Commons. And yesterday, when we were, you know, knew what was happening and, and, and phoning a few people to, to let them know what was, what was going on, uh, I'll spare his blushes, but there was a, a Tory MP I spoke to who burst into tears. Um, I just, th I think she just had this capacity to touch everybody she met, and um, I, 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 I kind of can't quite believe she's gone. And, and also the other thing, she's so life affirming that even now I just think of her in a very, very positive way. It's like very, very sad, but she was such a life affirming force. Often when someone dies, it's hard to remove the memory of them in the last few days. Mm. I think you're saying that the memory of other things is just so much more powerful than that. What in particular do you recall? Well, I think the... I mean, on the political level, as Seb Co said this morning, we wouldn't have had the Olympics without her. We wouldn't have had Sure Start without Tessa, and that was driven by her politics. We, she changed the way we talk about health... We think about the health service and healthcare. But I think it's the, it is the more personal stuff. And my one moment, I remember you, the film you did, and she introduced you to the band Skipinish, a Scottish band that we'd introduced her to. And my abiding memory, even this morning, was of her dancing in her own kitchen to a song called Alive. Um, and that's how I remember her, because she, uh, even though she's dead, I think of her as, as giving this sense of positivity to to other people. So I just remember as a positive life force who never stopped smiling and never stopped being dedicated and motivated by other people. 
Alice Gamble, thank you for joining us. Thank you for those memories of Tessa Jowell. I still remember leaving her home sad but with an enormous smile on my face. Let's turn to the newspapers. The news came too late for the newspaper front pages. Let's just whiz through them. The Sunday Telegraph has a Brexit story. Dozen ministers desert May on customs. The Observer has a different angle. One million students join calls for vote on Brexit deal. That's student unions backing that call. The Sunday Times, interestingly, although it has an interview with the Prime Minister or has an article by her, chooses to lead on its famous rich list. At last, the self-made rich triumph over old money. And the Mail on Sunday uh, reveals exclusively, it says, that Meghan's dad staged the photos with the paparazzi. Well, uh, with that and more from the papers, uh, we're joined by Chloe Wesley, by Ellie May O'Hagan and Camilla Long. And first of all, Chloe, what caught your eye? Brexit, I assume. Yeah, I went for the Brexit story. Um, so there's a story on the front page of the Telegraph about uh, ministers taking issue with this new customs partnership. Um, and the reason why they're taking issue is because this new customs partnership would inhibit the UK's ability to sign trade deals with other countries. It's very difficult to see how it differs all that much from customs union memberships. So there's, there's a big um, discussion about this. So people like you on the right of politics, you work for the Taxpayers Alliance, are basically saying we want to cut free properly. We don't want to well, halfway exactly. out. They're huge opportunities. I mean, if we leave the customs union, we can lower tariffs on food, which would lower the cost of food by about, it's estimated, 17%. So there are huge opportunities for people. Now, in your paper, The Sunday Times, yes. Camilla, you have the Prime Minister herself. But yes. you're not excited enough about her to put her as the front page splash. Well, they did put her in my slot. So um, when I woke up this morning, I was a bit surprised to see I'd been replaced so quickly. Um, but she's not nearly so lively, is she? Well, I'm not worried. I mean, um, I'm sure it'll be fine. She's written a piece. Um, uh, which is sort of firm Theresa, but as we know, sort of firm Theresa is always followed by hopeless and indecisive Theresa. So at the start, she says we are going to leave. It sounds quite Brexity, you know, we're going to leave the customs union, we're going to take back control of our money, we're going to take back control of our borders, etc., etc. And then you sort of get to the end, and it sort of says, I, I will need your help and support to get there. So it sort of slightly turns quite a little bit begging and a little bit sort of, you know, we're all in this together, maybe. You know, maybe we're all in a bit of this problem together and we're going to have to collaborate. I think she's appealing to people like you, Chloe. She's basically That's saying something. to Brexiteers in this piece, isn't she, trust me mm. and don't mess it up. Now, do you? Well, she's, she's recognising that the Leave vote was a, le a, a vote to take back control of laws, borders, money and trade. But I think that the appeal is also to those on the Remain side. We do need to come together as a country. This is a huge opportunity. And we need to start squabbling about the debate from two years ago and move on to what kind of country we're going to be. Now, anyway, you might be enjoying the Tories' problems as a supporter of the Labour Party, but there's also a great big argument about whether Labour needs to be clearer in its policy, with the Observer saying that uh, a million students... Now, what they've done, if they've just added up all the members of student unions, so it's not quite right, so a million students are backing calls, <clears throat> particularly on Jeremy Corbyn, to give a Brexit vote. I mean, I think that um, this initiative to start a grassroots Remain campaign will probably do a lot better than the current um, tactic that a lot of Remainers seem to be using, which is uh, a lot of complaining and trying to reverse Brexit via legislation and the courts. And actually, I think probably I voted Remain. Um, I would like us to stay in the EU. But I think that what happened um, in the referendum is that the Leave campaign ran a very persuasive campaign and the Remain campaign ran a very poor campaign. And I think that what the Remain campaign needs to do now and what Remainers need to do now is to look at where they went wrong, to understand where people are and to kind of go back to the drawing board. And I think that a, a grassroots student-based campaign will probably do a lot better than um, strange hashtags and lots of complaints, which is what the, they seem to be going for at the moment. Camilla's looking you know, puzzled. I, just, I, I know this looks like one million students join the calls to vote for no, it Brexit. Is a, but it is it's, an over-exaggerated story. It's an exaggerated it story. It's actually only about 120 representatives, I think, at the NUS, which is rather different, I think. I mean, if we look back to the referendum, if we remember the students were the ones who didn't get, back, get out of bed to vote. So, I mean, if I were... You know, Theresa May, I probably wouldn't be too frightened about this campaign and at the moment. Well, would you, if you were Jeremy Corbyn, though? Ellie May, do you think he'll feel the pressure? Do people who agree with you will feel the pressure? Think, oh, Labour should change our policy? We think, no, we're just where we want to be. Ambiguous enough to exploit the Tories' problems. I mean, you know, this reminds me of the famous FDR quote. Um, I like the idea, I want to do it, and I'd go out there and make me do it. And so, really, 
whether Jeremy Corbyn feels pressure will come down to how successful this campaign is, really. Now, meanwhile, you've been uh, looking at the rich list in the Sunday Times. Yeah, um, this is a big story today. It's across all the papers in one way or another. Um, and the uh, Sunday Times has gone for this, what I regard as quite a strange headline, at last the self-made rich triumph over old money. And I think it's, it's just quite strange because, you know, uh, most people on the rich list have enlarged their fortunes over the last year. Um, and meanwhile, wages in this country are stagnating. Most people who are poor in this country are in work. A third of young people can't get a house. And so it suggests to me that while these people are incredibly, incredibly wealthy, actually the economy is broken and it does need to be redesigned. The, 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 the line that your paper chooses to go on is the fact it's the self-made, Camilla, yes. who are there. It's not hereditary wealth. And. The, the man who's at the top of the list, Jim Ratcliffe, is not somebody who's been on the rich list forever and ever and ever. He is he was born he in a Manchester council. He did 800 council. jobs and cancel union agreements and initiate a three-year pay freeze on his employees. Like, he is somebody who is has become rich off the back of his employees by deteriorating their conditions, lowering their wages. He's got rich at the expense of his employees, not to their benefit, and I think that's really important to what, make that clear. What do you think is the significance of the fact that it's slightly patronising to people who go to comprehensive schools on the grounds that most people go to comprehensive schools say, comprehensive school boy gets rich? I don't think it's patronising at all. I think, I mean, I think we, I think we have to accept that Everybody in the rich list, however far back you go, are you know they're self-made. So this is this is how rich is you know. And if you object to riches, if you object to people accumulating wealth, then obviously anything to do with the rich list is going to revolt you. I think no. Um, I think people but, object to gross unfairness, and I think that's what this story is about. It's grotesque. I don't now, talking know, hereditary I don't wealth. It, yes. Let's turn to the royal, shall oh, we? Oh yes. As we build up towards the royal yes. wedding, there's a nice front page. You've got it there, haven't you? Yes. Uh, of the uh, Mail on Sunday. So this is the story about Meghan Markle's father, who I had quite a soft spot for because he seemed rather sweet. And here we are, these pictures of him having himself, you know, measured up for a suit, trying to get in shape for, for the wedding. Apparently they're all staged. It's stunning. I mean, I would never have guessed that that with the hankies in the background was staged, but apparently it is. And, of course, the kicker on this is that the palace have been very firm about staying away from Meghan Markle's family. Only yesterday, I think, there was a notice issued to say, please, can you stay away from Thomas Markle? It seems little did the palace know that Thomas Markle was perfectly capable of dealing with the press himself. We should say that yes. uh, he insists that these were not staged. staged yes. yeah. Would you be shocked at the suggestion that they were? No, I just think poor Megan, you know, having this in the press and all of her family history, it's, like, it's a lot of pressure that she's under. Um, I'm very much looking forward to the royal wedding. I think it's going to be a great, great day. Everyone's going to be celebrating. But is it still on FA Cup final day? Because that is that is a difficult, difficult It is, dilemma. yes, it, it yeah. remains on FA Cup final day. And I think... I think be taught. Yeah. <laughs> I maybe. love, maybe. I love maybe. Meghan I Markle and me. football. I, I, I'm so going to be watching like, the cup final, though. You can just squeeze in a bit of both, I'm told. <laughs> yes. but, uh, it won't stop me going to Wembley. Now, finally, yes. last night, were you glued to the telly? Yeah. I was. I watched the whole thing from beginning to end. Yeah? So I'm quite tired this morning. Were you surprised? I, I mean, I have to say, I had to go to bed early in order to do this, so I missed, you missed it. Out. You missed out. You missed it's... out on Cyprus, which I still maintain was the best entry, and I got them in the sweepstakes. Well, and Australia. Israel's song is pretty Australia, nice. Australia was... I loved her dress. Yeah, Australia was great Israel song. was pretty quirky, wasn't it? Very different. Yeah, I, enjoyed, I particularly enjoyed the stage invasion because, of course, with all light entertainment, there needs to be somebody throwing themselves across the stage like Crafts when that man came and tried <laughs> to steal the dog, which was brilliant. Um, I mean, and Crafts I love is the a woman. superior yes. form of entertainment. To I love the, uh, the, the, the man running up, trying to steal a microphone from the singer, which, frankly, should happen in nearly every act. No, and, especially uh, Hungary. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You've got a story there the on your iPad, I think, Camilla, have you? Yes, here we are. This is the stage invasion. Um, and you can see this man who is not dressed up for the occasion um, is trying to take it away from her. And she said she was very brave. She powered on through and said, um, you know, I'm not, you know, we don't need to perform it again. You know, and everyone was very relieved. I love the sun on Sunday today, which uh, may, finds a way to combine <laughs> the stories. It's headline Eurovision Ding Dong Conquest. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> which is Theresa May. I'll quit the, yes, Theresa I'll May quit posing the as Eurovision unit, yes. singer. Yes. Saying, I'll quit the customs Brilliant. unit. Finally, all of Suri's dreams have come true. <laughs> <laughs> Chloe, Ellie, Camilla, thank you very, very much indeed thank for joining you. us. Now, the summer was glorious, wasn't it? 
while it lasted. The fact that it lasted just a few days is much too predictable to have warranted a mention on any of the front pages. Last night saw the return of fog and frost for some of us. Staff Deneos is here to tell us about how many extra layers we need to wear today. Staff. Thanks very much, Nick. Not too many extra layers. In fact, the warmth we did have was just a taster of what we can expect for summer, I gather. Now, as we head through the course of today, conditions will improve the further west and south that you are. More sunshine this morning, further east and north, there is more cloud and outbreaks of rain, all courtesy of this weather front. Now, it's bringing some pretty heavy rain to the northern half country, particularly for Scotland, and it's also bringing a bit more cloud and some murk across the eastern side. A little bit of rain as well across East Anglia and the southeast this morning. That should clear away. Conditions improving here and also for Scotland. The skies will brighten up as that rain becomes confined to the very far northeast and towards the Northern Isles. Could see the odd shower for the western parts of Northern Ireland, otherwise a lovely day for many better than yesterday for most, with temperatures of 16 to 18 Celsius. Now, as we head on in towards the overnight period, we'll see that rain eventually clear the mainland, push off in towards Orkney and linger on a bit in Shetland. We'll see a return of some cloud, a few showers just getting into the east coast, particularly the far southeast, a bit of cloud across Northern Ireland, otherwise it's a clear and another fairly chilly night, particularly in rural places. As we head on in towards Monday and Tuesday, in fact, for much of next week, high pressure takes control. It's looking lovely. It will be a warm start, then cooling down a little bit midweek onwards. Nick. Staff, thank you very much indeed. Trust me to deliver Brexit, the Prime Minister declares today. If she's to do so, she'll have to win the backing of her warring cabinet, secure the support of rebellious MPs and peers, and make a deal with 27 other EU countries. And none of that will be possible without the agreement of Ireland. Theresa May has repeatedly promised that whatever new trading arrangement Britain has with the EU will not lead to a new hard border between the North and the South. Earlier this week, I spoke to Ireland's Deputy Prime Minister, the Tornister, Simon Coveney, at the Irish Embassy here in London. We are trying to be uh, helpful in terms of finding ways to introduce some new thinking into these negotiations so that we can get beyond where we are today, which is stuck, um, so that we can deal with really important issues from an Irish perspective, like, for example, ensuring that there is no physical infrastructure on the Irish border in the future. And in yep. our view, if we can have a shared customs territory through some kind of customs partnership, which is British government language, uh, we think that that can be the basis uh, of a negotiation uh, to find a way forward. So what is it you're waiting for from British ministers? Well, certainly, first of all, it, it would be helpful if, if the British government actually had some consensus around this, this concept, uh, as opposed to consensus around something else, which people seem to think might work using technology or some other way of uh, creating as seamless a border as possible, but nevertheless border infrastructure. Like, let's not forget what's been agreed in, the, in these negotiations to date, because last December there was a clear agreement that the British Prime Minister signed up to, that there would be no border infrastructure of any kind on the island of Ireland and no related checks or controls. That means we're not talking about cameras and scanning systems and drones here. It means we're talking about a political solution that allows for regulatory alignment in a way that prevents the need for border infrastructure. Now, of course... That, well, that will sound to many people like you're merely restating a hope. Hope one we hope the UK doesn't leave at all. Hope two, we hope they stay in the single market. Hope three, we hope they stay in the customs union. But the government says he's not doing any of those We're things. not restating a hope. We expect that a clear commitment that was made by the British government in black and white in December and repeated again in March, we are simply asking that that commitment be followed through on. What I'm asking you is, what more do you need? Is it practical details? Or do you really want a concession that maybe this can't be done in the time available? I mean, there are two different negotiations going on at the moment, and it's important that people understand that. The first is to try to negotiate by the end of October a withdrawal treaty. In other words, the divorce arrangement between the European Union and the United Kingdom. And in that, there is a commitment that in order to address the Irish issues, which are quite unique in terms of this Brexit challenge, that, that there would be what's called a backstop arrangement. In other words, a fallback insurance mechanism to reassure people that there will be no infrastructure on the island of Ireland. And that is what is being negotiated at the moment in the context of the withdrawal treaty. Secondly then, 
there is a negotiation that started on the future relationship agreement, which in my view will probably go on for the next two years. So what we're saying here is that we need to see by the end of June, we need to see some progress on uh, how the Irish backstop in dealing with the Irish border is going to take shape if the Brexiteers, as they're often referred to, overrule Theresa May. If they say, look, forget a customs partnership, we don't like it, Boris Johnson has derided it, do you then say as the Irish government, will the EU then say, game up, no more talking, you haven't met your obligations, that's the end of it? Well, look, you know, to be honest, we don't take our lead from Boris Johnson in relation to Brexit. Uh, we take our lead from the Prime Minister. Uh, she has signed up to very clear commitments. She has written to Donald Tusk confirming those commitments. And I believe her, by the way. Uh, I believe yeah. she made those commitments uh, in good faith, well, and I believe she wants to follow through on them. What I'm asking you is the consequences if Theresa May cannot get the backing of her cabinet for those words, what are the consequences as far as Ireland are concerned, as far as the EU is concerned, when it comes to that June summit? Well, I, I think it's going to be a very difficult summer uh, for these negotiations if that happens. If we're expecting to get this thing concluded by the end of October, uh, is it unreasonable for the Irish government to ask for significant progress on a hugely important issue by the end of June, when, when it is actually factored into the EU negotiating guidelines that there would be a reassessment at the end of June okay. of progress. It's interesting I, you've quoted it, those guidelines. Let me quote them back at you. The EU negotiating guidelines call for flexible and imaginative solutions. Correct. Where is Ireland's flexibility? Where is your imagination? Where is your solution for dealing with this problem? It seems to me that what you're saying to the British government, you got us into this mess, you come up with a way of getting out of it. Well, let's talk about the Irish flexibility for a second then. You know, in December, when the British government wanted to move this process from phase one to phase two, uh, it was Ireland uh, who were uh, unsure about that because we hadn't made progress on the Irish border issue. Uh, we agreed to allow the process to move forward on the basis of a commitment from the British government that they would address comprehensively the Irish issue through a backstop or insurance mechanism. Again in March, when the negotiations were stuck and needed to move forward, uh, but were stuck again on, on an Irish border issue because a solution wasn't taking shape, again we showed flexibility to allow the process to move on. And just let me finish. We allowed the process to move on on the back of a commitment from the British Prime Minister that she accepted that within a withdrawal treaty there would be a legally operable backstop mm -hmm. in that withdrawal treaty unless and until something else was, uh, was negotiated. Now you will have heard some people claim that the Irish government is in effect weaponising the border. David Trimble, a man who was at the heart of creating the Good Friday Agreement, said the Irish Prime Minister is endangering more than three decades of goodwill built up between London and Dublin. Is it responsible to suggest that any sort of border will bring back the bad old days. If you live in the island of Ireland, if you live in the border counties, if you talk to people about their memories of the past in the context of the border, you'll often end up talking to somebody with tears in their eyes. This is not just a trading issue. This is about Ireland moving forward, communities and neighbours living together. It's about the fact that, you know, 100,000 what are called store cattle produced on small farms in the west of Ireland, cross the border to be finished on farms in Northern Ireland. Because there is no barrier. There is normal movement, normal life, normal commerce, normal business. And that has reinforced a peace process over the last 20 years because of shared EU membership and because of the Good Friday Agreement structures. And what we are saying here is that we don't want to undermine any of that. So does no hard border mean not a single camera at the border, no drones overhead? Well, I mean, look, we just simply think it won't work, you know, and, and what I would say to people is, look, you know, if you don't believe me on it, you know, listen to people who are, uh, who are living locally there. Listen to the chief constable of the PSNI. You know, he is saying that any infrastructure on the border, any physical infrastructure on the border is going to represent a risk to his officers. He's warning not to go down that route. Uh, listen to the, uh, to the Brexit uh, committee in Westminster. They've said, Technology is not the solution to solving the Irish border issues, and we agree with that. You know, I would challenge you, show me a border somewhere in the world that, that, that is seamless. 
Uh, it doesn't exist, is the answer. And that is why the only way we can find a solution here that means that we have a fully seamless border with no physical infrastructure or related checks and controls is to maintain alignment in terms of rules and regulations on both sides of that border. I hear your sincerity, but I also hear a man who wants to be seen to be flexible, but sounds to me awfully like a man who's saying, let's hope the British Parliament votes for the customs union, which we've always wanted, defies the government, and then we can do away with all these problems. But let me be very clear, I'm not flexible when it comes to border infrastructure. I've never been. The so Irish talk about this no, talk no, about being flexible on the customs partnership no, is that no, just talk? No, is it? no, no. As long as it achieves the outcome of there being no physical infrastructure on the island of Ireland and no related checks or controls, I hope also, by the way, the outcome can be delivered to create no new, new barriers between Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom, either. Because I understand that unionism is really concerned by that. All of that reminds me that I asked you whether you wanted Parliament to defy ministers and vote for the customs union, which is Irish government policy. And you do, don't you? Well, I think you know politics well enough to know that if an Irish government minister started to get involved in Westminster parliamentary votes, uh, I would be on very dangerous territory. You would, so but the I will, smile I, I see on your face now I will leave that would to be the wisdom. on your face if Parliament voted for a customs union. I will leave Problems that. over. I will say. leave that. I mean, look, we, we've said from the start that we believe if we had a shared customs space or a shared customs territory, which would need to be negotiated, that would help to solve a lot of the issues that are stalling these negotiations right now. Simon Coveney, Tarnister, thank you for talking to me. Thank you very much. Anytime. Thank you. Watching that with me, the Shadow Brexit Secretary, Labour's Sir Keir Starmer. Good morning to you. Morning. Before we talk about that interview and about Brexit, a word, if you would, about Tessa Jowell, Dame Tessa Jowell, who died Yeah, this, th this is really sad news this morning. Tessa was a friend. She was actually a constituent, lived just up the road um, from me, and there's so many things that we remember her for. I think I'll remember her. She came into Parliament, into the Commons, just three or four weeks ago. There was a debate about cancer, and she was there in the undergallery. And then we had a reception, and... Tessa being Tessa, went up to the podium just to say a few words about other people. She was struggling, she couldn't really speak very well. Um, but even in that moment, the last few weeks, uh, you saw the Tessa we all know. Now, turning now to that interview yeah. with Simon Coveney, he is saying to the government, your policy is not good enough, but he is effectively also saying to Labour, isn't he? Neither is your policy good enough to avoid a hard border. Well, I think we are in a farcical situation at the moment, nearly two years after the referendum, uh, the Cabinet is fighting over two customs options, neither of which, frankly, are workable, neither of which are acceptable to the EU, and if either of which were put to the vote in Parliament, uh, they probably wouldn't carry a majority. What I heard at the end of that interview was your suggestion that the way out of this impasse is for it to be put to a vote in Parliament. We want a vote uh, on a customs union with the EU, a customs union. Um, and that, that am an amendment to achieve that has been put down to the Trade Bill and the Customs Bill, which finished their committee stage on the 1st of February this year. And the Parliament uh, and the Government won't put that before us. So we can... That's but actually the way to, to resolve this impact. I understand perfectly reasonably you want to have a go at the Government and the mess they're well, in, well, but I asked you about your policy. Yeah. And the reason I asked you about your policy is, I put it to you again, Labour's policy would not be good enough to get rid of the fear of a hard border, to get rid of the possibility of an Irish veto over the next stage of the Brexit negotiations, would it? I don't accept that. It would. We have said a comprehensive customs union with the EU, that's a, a necessary minimum. Nobody credible has suggested you can have no hard border in well, Northern is, Ireland. Is this credible? With that, with, with, is this uh, credible? Just, just let me finish. You, can, you can't sweep the customs union and the single market off the table on the one hand and also say you don't want a hard border in Northern Ireland. Is, is that a credible view? Yes, of course it is. Well, there are your words in yeah, that, Jeff. And yet your policy is to oppose the single no, market. No, no, no. Just, just let me finish this, because it is important. I need, what we propose uh, is a combination. On the one hand, a comprehensive customs union, and nobody credible suggests you can achieve no hard border without it, and also... Um, a strong single market relationship that hardwires the benefits of the single market into the future agreement. So we do have something very strong to say about the single market. We have well, our manifesto commitment. You have a hope, you have a wish, uh, you have an ambition, you have no deal on it. Our manifesto... Well, 
our manifesto commitment was the benefits of the single market. Okay. They have to be hardwired into the future growth. A manifesto that commitment. Combination, that me, case, combination let me, let me will deal with the Northern Ireland situation. A, a manifesto commitment which your own former party leader in the House of Lords this week described as a serious evasion of duty. Now, as you know, the House of Lords voted to support, with lots of Labour yeah. front benches from the past, backing it, membership of what's called the European Economic Area, in effect, yeah. staying in the single market. But it is the Labour Party's policy to reject that. Well, it's very important that we're clear about what Labour Party policy is. Insofar as the Lords uh, were really raising a concern that the government is sweeping the single market benefits off the table and hasn't got a proposition. They're, they're right about that and we need to reflect on that. What the Lords then went on to do is to say the answer is the Norway model, um, which is the EEA. So they then went on to a very specific model. Well, now, how will you reflect uh, on well, it? Just, just let me finish. In, that has been put forward so many times that I went to Norway for several days to look at how the model works. And Norway is essentially very close to the single market, but out of a customs union. It has infrastructure on the border with Sweden. So, in my view, that's not the answer. But to the challenge, does the agreement need to hardwire in the benefits of the single okay. market? The answer from Labour is very clear. Yes, it does. And well, I the, accept the answer, that, that me, the answer is rather like ministers, the customs union. which is, here's a great long wish list of things we hope that Brussels would agree with, that you have no evidence that they will. Uh, Michel, well, Barnier, we, we... Michel Barnier said a UK decision to leave the single market, Labour policy, and to leave the customs union would make border checks unavoidable. Well, look, the single market arrangements that we're currently in are in the membership agreement, and therefore we need a new agreement. We want an agreement that has the benefits of the single market in. We have gone way further than the government on this because we've said we recognise that means no drop-off in standards, rights and protections, no new trade impediments, full access. So we've spelt out what it means. The, the argument that's going on in the Labour Party really is not about should the benefits of the single market be hardwired in. We all agree on that. The mm. question is, how do we achieve that? Well, you, some you, you people, make out that everybody's happy with this. David Miliband is flying in from the United States, writing articles in the Mail on Sunday and appearing tomorrow, because he doesn't think it's clear. Neil Kinnock doesn't think it's clear. Peter Mandelson doesn't think it's clear. The House of Lords don't think it's clear. It's got so bad, this failure of leadership on Europe, the Duke of Wellington <laughs> is making a stand which the Labour Party is not willing to copy. Well, look, We've been absolutely clear what the combination needs to be. I think for, for, for many months we've been talking past each other. Everybody, I think, accepts there's going to have to be a new agreement, a UK-EU uh, agreement. What goes in that agreement really matters. That's why that manifesto commitment that the benefits of both the customs union and the single market need to be in it is so important. And I accept we need to keep on saying it. We need to make sure it's the combination customs union and single market, um, because we need that combination to deliver for trade and also to deliver uh, on the border in Northern Ireland. The solemn yeah. commitment there shouldn't be a hard border. Everyone accepts, I speak to in politics, that you're doing your best to bridge this big divide in your party. Remain voters on the one hand, leave voters and so on. Just try finishing the following sentence for me. Brexit will be good for Britain because... Well, uh, it's very difficult for me to complete that sentence because I voted to remain and I wanted to remain. So why don't you oppose it properly? The, the Labour Party accepted that we put the referendum to the people. Um, we got a result. Now, it was a slim result. It was a narrow majority, but the, the question that was answered um, was answered. But the only question that was answered was, should we leave or not? Well, the next front page of the Observer today the is next, a call for another vote. The How next about question that? that comes along is, what's the future relationship with the EU? What should it look like? Just a brief chance to respond. Student unions around the country yep. are saying that they want another vote. Many supporters of Jeremy Corbyn, amongst the young in particular, yep. saying they want another vote. It's still possible Labour will come to that view, isn't well, it? The focus of our attention has been that there should be a meaningful vote in Parliament. That will happen, we hope, in October, November. We're trying to make that truly meaningful, which is if we vote down the deal, Parliament decides what happens next, because that's what a meaningful vote should look like. Sir Keir Stone, thank, thank you very you. much for joining us. Now, coming up later on BBC One, Sarah Smith will speak to the former Tory leader and Brexiteer, Ian Duncan Smith. And the man he beat for the top job, leading pro-European Ken Clark. She'll also be joined by Labour's Baroness Chakrabarty. That's the Sunday Politics at 11, here on BBC One. Now, of all the scandals to rock Westminster since the war, the most extraordinary was the affair that destroyed the career of Jeremy Thorpe. The former Liberal leader was suave, sophisticated and charismatic, a man who many thought could one day take his party into government. He was brought down, though, by a botched attempt to have his ex-lover, Norman Scott, murdered. 
In a new drama, a very English scandal, Hugh Grant plays Jeremy Thorpe, and when Andrew met up with him recently, he began by describing Thorpe's appeal and his fatal flaws. I thought I was rid of him, and then, out of the blue, that, to Mother, telling her everything. Did she believe it? No, no, of course not. So now he says he's taken rooms in Dublin under the care of a father's sweetman. This is where you come in, Mr. Oh, God, doing what exactly? You take that thing and you confront him in Dublin. I can't put anything in writing, so I need you to see him in person and warn him off, and I mean that. He was very, he was a flamboyant dresser, he was incredibly charming, he was amusing, he, he was charismatic, and um, he a sort of media darling, really, and he was a brilliant broadcaster, a brilliant communicator, uh, and a big hope for the Liberal Party, perhaps their last big hope, one might say controversially. But he harboured a secret, which was that he was gay, and of course in the early 60s that was still uh, illegal, uh, and even after it became decriminalised, it was still not something he wanted to, uh, to talk about or admit to, especially as by then he was married and he had mm. a child. And, and he was, you know, this very prominent member of the establishment. Um, and so he, uh, when he found himself stalked, as he would have put it, and, and plagued by one ex-lover, Norman Scott, for upwards of um, 18 years, he... 18 years? Is well, right? really, yeah, they, they first uh, uh, got together in, I think it was 1961. The trial was in 79. So uh, it was quite a long time this was all going on. And um, uh, this, there was Jeremy Thorpe, this member of the establishment, the most connected man in, in London, um, taking out a very amateurish English hit on this ex-lover. He says, we, 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 we'll have to kill him. Yeah. Uh, at an astonishing moment. And it, it's no worse than putting down a sick dog. Yes, yes. Which is ironic, given what happens to a dog later in the story. <laughs> well, yes, exactly. You know, for a time, Thorpe, when all this started to emerge, he denied that any of that, those conversations had happened. And subsequently, he changed his story a bit and said, well, I didn't mean it, I did say it, but it was like it's saying, who will rid me of this turbulent priest? And my, my friends just took me, you know, too literally. And yeah. I'm, I'm appalled by what they try to do. But uh, it did end, or it ended up in this trial mm. of the century at the Old Bailey, which was, you know, massive. And uh, you remember it. I, I, I know you. I know you're old enough. I'm old enough. Um, you know, remember all the jokes and the private eye coverage, and it was it was a big thing. Absolutely. Why is it a very English scandal? Well, I think partly because it was so amateurish. Um, <laughs> it was he was an old Etonian uh, from Trinity College, Oxford. He loved classical music. He was just the last person in the world that you would expect to go around murdering. Well, yeah, murdering. he's a long way from from Goodfellas. And you know, he asked his best friend to ask someone to ask someone to ask someone. Way down the chain, they found the world's least likely, most hopeless hitman, mm. who was a sort of out of work pilot, with a 1911 Luger pistol that jammed. Come the event, and and, and then he missed the guy and shot the dog instead. And it's just all hopeless. Uh, so that's very English. And I think the cover-up, uh, not only of this attempted murder, but also the fact that he was gay is sort of, you know, you could, you could call English and it's, it's... Yeah, I mean, it struck me this must be a glorious part to play. Did you find you had sympathy for him? Thorpe, I mean, not Scott. Um, I enjoyed him is the word I would use. Mm. And I think that's enough. Mm. I, I enjoyed him. I, I, I think I know the breed he came from. I think men like that used to come to dinner parties yeah. at my parents' house, and they were very smooth, and they had the same suits and the same socks that came up to there with garters, and they always had something charming to say, which we just thought, what are you really, what are you really like? So I knew the type, and then, uh, and I, he, he was a narcissist. He, he, you know, even his best friends who I've spoken to mm. admit that, and I find that very easy to relate to. <laughs> and funnily enough, I think he's my third narcissist in a row, because I think that clearly Phoenix Buchanan in Paddington 2 is a narcissist. Yes. And I think the guy I played in uh, Florence Foster Jenkins, the film yeah. I made with Stephen yes. Frizz, was all me, me, me. He was an actor. So there's a pattern emerging there. So uh, yeah, I, I, I got the narcissism. But the bit that's, that's hardest to get is how to say, well, then we have to kill him and, re and really mean it and really understand mm. why he said that. 
Well, I wondered because, I mean, you've been through some tough times. You've had the beast on your back with its claws in your flesh, as it were, and had to go out there and carry on and put on the front and carry on doing what you do. And it strikes me one of the weird things about Thorpe is that he was carrying on performing at a very, very high level yeah. on the hustings, in the House of Commons, yeah. electioneering, yeah. knowing all this stuff was going on behind him. I know, incredible. His career and politics was so important to him. He'd, ad he'd adored politics mm. almost since he was 12. His father was an MP, his grandfather was an MP. And he loved it, and he was massively into it at Oxford. And all he wanted was to get ahead in politics and to know more people, to know the movers and shakers, you know, whether yes. it be cabinet ministers or the, the owners of newspapers or whatever. So he was never going to let that go. It was everything to him, and that's really his tragedy. You see, you, you want to say to him, just give up, give up. Mm. You slightly white, you want to say to Theresa May now, you can't be having a nice time. Just yeah. leave. Exactly. Yeah, they're so addicted to their career mm. that they'll do anything. So this is a cause that um, I have every reason to believe will be won. And therefore, I personally have no um, intention of easing up or giving up. Now the campaigning you've been doing hacked off. I wonder, has that sort of got in the way of full-time acting? I mean, has it taken over your life in some respect? Uh, well, it uh, has to a certain extent taken over my life. It became it's a absolutely riveting. It's one of the reasons I enjoyed doing this film, because I've, having not been... On Theresa May tries to reassure Brexit backers today, and no wonder she feels the need to do so after Boris Johnson called one of her policy ideas crazy and Jacob Rees-Mogg dubbed it cretinous. She's now given cabinet ministers, including one of the leaders of the Leave campaign, the Environment Secretary Michael Gove, the job of finding a policy they can agree on. Good morning to you, Mr Gove. Hi, good morning, Nick. Now, before we talk about Brexit, let's have a word about Dame Tessa Jowell, yes. who died this morning. The Prime Minister has spoken of her dignity and courage in confronting her illness. She really did appeal across boundaries. This is not just people oh, being polite, is it? Oh, completely. No, um, um, it's, it's incredibly sad news. Dame Tessa was um, one of the kindest and most thoughtful people you could find in public life. I remember as a, a young backbencher asking a, a question about my constituency uh, when she was culture secretary. After the formal answer that she gave, she then sought me out behind the speaker's chair to see if there was anything more that she could do to help. And I also remember when I brought uh, uh, other issues and other problems to her, she couldn't have been more determined to try to help me as a, as, a, as a Conservative from the other side to do the right thing by the people whom I represented. And then I remember uh, the immensely moving speech, which we saw a little bit of earlier in the news, that she gave in the House of Lords talking about, about cancer care. There were a number of my colleagues who were you know, moved to tears by what she had to say. And I remember seeing her at dinner that night with her, her wonderful family, who will be missing her terribly. And um, the thing that struck me throughout is that she's one of those people who brings joy into other people's lives because she's transparently, she was transparently, uh, there to try to do the right thing. Well, many more tributes to Tessa Jowell later in the day. Let's turn to Brexit. Of course. The sort of issue that uh, Tessa Jowell would have believed was incredibly important Absolutely. to get right. It is now 689 days since the referendum. I suspect you count each and every one of them off. Why has the government still not got a policy on our future trading relationship with the EU? Well, significant progress has been made in all sorts of areas in the negotiations with the EU. If you've been a member of a club for 40 years, if you've built up the ties and relationships that we have, then disentangling those in order to get all the benefits of Brexit necessarily take time. Um, but as Simon Coveney, the Irish Deputy Foreign Minister, said 
earlier in this programme. We now have a situation where we have uh, agreement on an implementation period in, in order to get some of the details absolutely right. We also have agreement that the rights of EU citizens and UK citizens will be respected. We have agreement on the amount that the UK will pay as we leave. And also, in the, in the great article that the Prime Minister has written in the Sunday Times today, we have agreement across the government that leaving the European Union will give us the opportunity to sign new trade deals so that we can take advantage of globalization's benefits. And also, we will have the opportunity to take back control of our money and our laws. Sure, that's a long-winded way, if you'll forgive me, of saying all the things you have achieved. But 689 days since the referendum, you are apparently no closer to the most central thing, which is what our future economic relationship with the EU should be. Now, you're on a cabinet working group mm. uh, to deal with this so-called new customs partnership. Boris Johnson calls it crazy. Is he right? Well, you mentioned that I was long-winded. I think what I was trying to do was to emphasise that over the, the 600 or so days, we have made progress in lots of areas. Is Boris now, Johnson right to call it crazy? Well, you, you ask about Boris's uh, comments on the new customs partnership. In the interview that Boris gave to the Daily Mail, he pointed out some of the flaws with the new customs partnership. And across government, across cabinet, there is agreement that neither of these two models is absolutely perfect. And with the new customs partnership, Boris pointed out that because it's, it's novel, because no model like this exists, there have to be significant question marks over the deliverability of it on time. More than that, what the new customs partnership requires the, the British government to do is, in effect, to act as the tax collector and very possibly the uh, effective delivery of regulation for the European so, Union. So it, and the Prime Minister yep. is very clear today that what we need to do is to take back control of our borders. Mm -hmm. And that means not just trade, but of course, as the PM pointed out, control of immigration numbers. I want to be clear, though. And is it, it the be... government's view, is it your view, as someone on the committee, that this idea is crazy? It's my view that the new customs partnership has flaws and that they need to be tested, and that the Prime Minister, quite rightly, has set up two groups, one on which I sit to look at the new customs partnership, another one on which David sure. Davis, Karen Bradley um, and uh, Greg Clark will sit in order to look at the other highly streamlined customs arrangements so that we're putting forward. Let's be clear what your job is but this on is... this working group. Let's be clear what your Absolutely. job is. You don't job, want to say our job president. is... Is, is it as cabinet it? ministers... Is it, hold on, I'll ask the question if it's OK, and then you can answer it. Well, it I, was, job, I was answering your earlier question. Is it your job to save the new customs partnership, dubbed crazy by Boris Johnson, or is it your job to bury it? It's our job, as we do every day in government, Nick, to look at different policy options and to test them rigorously. One of the things about government is that uh, whether we're developing a new policy on air quality or a policy on customs, that uh, the expertise of different government departments, the ministers who lead them, the brilliant officials who work with us, is then brought to bear. And when a policy we proposition is put forward, whether it is the new customs partnership or an alternative, then naturally we'll want to make sure that it meets certain tests. Sure. And the Prime Minister laid out those tests very clearly in her article in the Sunday Times today. What we need to do is to make sure that we're outside the customs union. That's what people voted for. That was what was in our manifesto so you at the time of the last general election. And, and, and yeah, critically... You ministers are taking as, that as... control from the experts, are you? So Ollie Robbins, who's the Prime Minister's key advisor... No, 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 no. You're, no. you're taking back control because he's come up with a policy that's crazy and no. it takes the like of you and Boris Johnson to make it not crazy. That's so unfair to Ollie Robbins um, and, and to the other colleagues. Um, you can, you... Just so we're, we're clear, Ollie Robbins, a man you support, staying in that job and think he's doing a good job. Uh, I, 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 I spent an hour with Ollie last week talking through all of these issues. It was a, an incredibly enjoyable and fascinating conversation. So all those people who say he should be sacked, no, no, no. people he's... who say his policies are crazy, no, you're, you're telling him to shut up. Yes, he's, an, he's a very yeah. able... Um, and genuinely public-spirited civil servant who's doing an excellent job. Well, but the truth is that, that um, it's always the case in government that you will have discussions between mm. civil servants who will offer ideas and then uh, ministers who will test them robustly. I want to get so your response to Simon Coveney, because you the, the, the use of the phrase yeah. take back control, which you deployed there with such such wit and guile. The truth is that taking back control is what we voted to do as a country those 600 odd days ago. And what we're seeking to do and what Oli is helping us to do okay. is to make sure that we have the policies that deliver for the British people. I want to talk about the detail of the policy. Uh, Simon Coney, the Irish Tornister, the uh, Deputy Prime Minister in other words, mm. said this will not work, the technology option that you have long backed. Do you think he's bluffing? No, I think that he's doing a very good job as a diplomat, as the foreign minister for his country, in putting across its case. But you think when he talks about the dangers to peace, 
it could perhaps be overstating it. Well, um, I certainly won't give someone who's a very talented um, Deputy Prime Minister advice on how to do their job. What I will say is that, of course, the, the Irish Deputy Prime Minister, the, uh, who is their foreign spokesman, will, um, will naturally put the case for Ireland with but fluency and with force, there are some who but these are negotiations. Is, yeah, there are some who believe that this argument about peace and the border is a kind of Trojan horse being used, because Ireland wants to persuade MPs, to defeat your government and ensure that you stay in the customs union. Is it a Trojan horse? I think you're putting words in the Irish Deputy Prime Minister's mouth. I mean, I bet you you're quoting to... back to you what no, no. you said to a dinner of Brexiteers. You, tried you to... said the Irish <laughs> were responsible for using having a Trojan no, no, I horse. Well, I, would, I would never be so... I hope I would never be so rude about any country. You're, you're the, saying the, the Malloyds didn't pass your no, lips. The, the, the truth is that the Irish Deputy uh, Prime Minister is making yeah. the case from Ireland's point of view, but we've got a negotiation, and there is give and take in the negotiation. As um, Simon Coveney pointed out, there have been occasions in the past when Ireland, having uh, insisted upon a particular proposition, then decided, actually, do you know what? When push comes to shove, we'll show a bit of flexibility. So and they the might in the future. Okay. Yes. Let, let, let's move on to the issue of time. Yes. Now, some people say that time is the solution mm. to some of these problems. Mm. That, yes, the technological solution to the border isn't ready now, Give it three or four years. Are you one of those that think that might be the way forward? No, in delay there lies no plenty, as Shakespeare once said. Um, one of the things that we need to do is to crack on. Now, I think that uh, we have an implementation period that gives us an additional 21 months after we leave the European Union to get everything right. And Not a month after that, no, for I customs. Think, I think the critical thing is to meet that deadline. Uh, my experience in government um, reinforces my belief that uh, we need to uh, make sure that we deliver things at pace. And in my own area, we're doing everything we can in order to make sure that the food and drink can clear. cross borders without interruption, and that we do that, or with a minimum of friction, I should say, and we do that in order to ensure that all the benefits of leaving the European Union, control over who comes sure. here, control over trade deals, and also the money that we can take back and yep. then spend on our priorities like the NHS, we do all that in order to ensure those benefits can be delivered on day one this can after be, the implementation This can be period. a one-word answer, if you wouldn't mind. Just to be absolutely clear, those who say that the customs union should just be extended a few months, your own friend and colleague Nick Bowles, you are saying no extension at all in any circumstances to deal with the customs problem, yes or no? Yes. Yes. There will not be an extension. Yes. Okay. That's the difficulty with one-word answers yeah. when, you ask, when you ask questions <laughs> that long, Nick. Yeah. But the truth is, I don't believe in an extension. You don't believe in an extension. That no. is very clear. Um, do you believe that uh, Brexit is, as one of the people who led the Leave campaign, would you say it's working out as it was meant to? Yes, I think it is. Dan I think Hannan thinks it's not working out, and he is one of the most prominent supporters of Leave. Yes, um, Dan is an incredibly articulate and thoughtful uh, member of the European Parliament, great friend of mine, um, but I, I take a slightly different view from Dan um, in this regard. I think that the Prime Minister is delivering exactly what the 17.4 million people voted for, exactly what was in our manifesto. Is it a shambles, this process? Oh, absolutely not, no. Because... Not, not a shambles, even though your friend, colleague, um, organiser of the Leave campaign, Dominic Cum Cummings, has described the whole Brexit process since the referendum as a shambles. He has a gift for vivid metaphor. Um, my view, being in government, is that the Prime Minister has laid out a very, very clear flight path for us, and that flight path is to uh, ensure that when we leave the European Union, that the, the money that we save can be spent on the NHS, that the trade deals that we can sign can make this country more prosperous, and critically, that we can control who comes here, so we can have an immigration policy that serves our interests economically, but also allows us to continue to play a role as a humane beacon of freedom. Final question in one word again. Should Brexiteers attacking the Prime Minister trust her? Yes. Michael Cove. One word answers. Thank you very much indeed. Now look at what's coming up straight after this programme. Join us at 10, live from Birmingham, where we'll be debating regulation of the press. Has the government let them off the hook? And then God. As some Quakers reveal God is a term many of them feel uncomfortable with, we'll be asking whether you can be a Christian without believing in the Almighty. See you at 10 on BBC One. That's almost it for this week. Thanks to all my guests. Emma Barnett will be sitting in this chair, sitting in for Andrew next Sunday at nine. Her guests will include the great Anthony Hopkins. Till then, from us all, goodbye. <laughs>